strength. It's defined as a quality or state of being strong, capacity for exertion or endurance. But there is more to it than that. It's often used as a way to describe an attribute, a skill, or simply what a person is good at. This video has been made for those who cannot see their own qualities, who look at themselves and see someone bereft of any personal strengths and just feel weak. Everyone has self-doubts and insecurities to a degree. It's part of being human. But from my own observations and from my own experience, furries and young adults in general often look within and just yearn for something to offer others. The thing is, you already have something to offer. You already have good qualities. You just can't see it. There is an alluring voice that is so easy to listen to, telling you that you don't have these things or you are worse than your friends, and that you will never be good enough for anything. It reasons with you, brings up your failings, and it all seems to make sense. In those moments, it's cold and lonely, and the weight of your own perceived uselessness crushes you. This voice, with its reason, is so easy to listen to, and it just seems to make sense. But in reality, it's nothing but a beautiful lie, and I will show you why. This video is broken into three parts, and each part will be sharing real experiences that I have had, or someone that I know that's close to me. And hearing these stories and experiences, maybe it can help someone out there just rethink things, because it helped me. These different aspects in the video are personal strengths, comparisons, and body image. Strength. We often judge ourselves and self-worth based on others, on their accomplishments or how successful they are. It makes sense, considering we are very social animals. I fear, however, that we have lost a particular consideration, one that has blinded us to what we have really achieved in our lives. Let's say I have a friend here who I admire. My friend here is a fantastic speaker and an entertainer. He's successful at his job, far better at Blender and Unity than I am, etc, etc. In my eyes, he's a lot better than me. A lot of his traits just seem to come naturally to him. Some of these things I can do to a degree, but he does them better. And I always feel a bit behind and not good enough when he's around. I know it's an insecurity, but it's still there and it's impossible to ignore. We often use other people's successes to compare ourselves and put ourselves down. It's easy to say that comparison is the thief of joy, and in some ways I agree, but it's not that simple because of this. Your pedestal is closely below your friends, but what your friends cannot see, and more importantly what you fail to take in yourself, is that your pedestal is on top of a mountain. Some people have natural talents or are born into a forgiving, encouraging and kind household with a healthy body and mind. Some people, however, have none of these things. We often don't take progress into account. We focus on success, which I believe is a bit wrong, especially when you're starting from the very bottom, whereas others may have started near the top. You may have climbed an incredible amount to be where you are and done a lot more than your peers and you may still feel like you're not good enough. Struggling all the time with no context why someone struggles can easily make a person feel like there is something wrong with them while seemingly others do not struggle at all. I'm going to give an example of someone I met. I have gotten permission to retell this but some parts have been altered to protect identity. I met Marie several years ago. She always seemed nice and very talkative. We didn't have many mutual interests, but we still managed to build a good friendship. She was married, had two little boys, and she was a senior web developer. 
I would see her every other week whilst visiting work friends at a local pub, and eventually I was invited to a camping trip in North Yorkshire by the same group of people. Marie was also there, and so were some of our non-work friends. On the trip, whilst alone after a few drinks, she told me that she's going to miss all this, referring to the camping trip. I asked her what she meant, and she explained that she was feeling rather anxious about some of our friends drifting away for perfectly normal reasons, such as starting a new family or getting a job elsewhere, and now she's just terrified to be alone. I suggested that she would surely make more friends going forward, and she responded that it's not that simple for her. She told me that she was scared of being alone because she knows what it's like to have no one at all. She then told me a bit about her childhood. She grew up in a household that can only be described as a drug den. Her parents were heroin addicts and they would also deal narcotics to others. Their customers would often come into their house and inject themselves on the family couch and lay there for hours. Sometimes they would argue or fight with her father. There were also occasions where she would be made to go collect drugs for them and even be used as a shield if a pickup went wrong. She told me that one time her father had a knife pulled on him and he hid behind her, pleading with the assailant to stop because he had a daughter. She wanted to get away, but her parents convinced her that going into foster care would be very bad for her, that her foster parents would beat her, and there would be 20 other children in the same household who would bully her relentlessly. The situation only got worse as she got older. She was sometimes forced to take small amount of drugs to entertain the druggies, and if she refused, she would be locked in a room for days at a time, or she would be physically assaulted. Shortly after she turned 16, her parents were caught, her house was raided, and her mother and father were arrested. At the earliest opportunity she had, fearful of any kind of foster care, she ran away. To survive, she would visit local pubs and ask men if she could stay with them with the offer for a good time. This was to keep a roof over her head. Eventually, she got a job with some encouragement from friends that she had met along the way and managed to break out of this cycle, but it had been going on for several years at this point. I met her later on when she was engaged with her boyfriend. She's terrified of people abandoning her and she's scared of being alone. She never really formed meaningful relationships until she broke the cycle she was in and she never wants to let that go. Now she's feeling this anxiety quite strongly and she told me that she feels so weak for being this way and feels weak for telling me how she feels, whilst others seem to be able to just accept that we're all in our 30s now and moving on in life. Weak. She thought she was weak. I disagreed with her. From growing up in a drug den, the abuse she suffered, the things she was forced to see and do, to now having a loving husband, a well-paid job and two children? It's nothing short of a miracle. She's one of the strongest people I've ever met. The tenacity to keep climbing step by step is admirable. It's all too easy to just give up and stay where you are and stagnate. But if you are still taking those steps, you are already kicking ass. Progress, not perfection. And that leads me to my next point, because I bet there are people who will watch this and think that they have no right to feel how they do, to be as bad as they are at things, because they feel like they have not had it hard like Marie, like there is no excuse to feel how they do. This isn't really the case. Your situation may not be the same, but a comparison is pointless. How you feel is an entirely personal experience. No one should dismiss how you feel, and that includes you. Just because you cannot point at a specific reason for struggling doesn't make it any less real. Dismissing it just makes it fester. I've met people that berate themselves because they're forced to struggle this way, but I ask you this. If you know a person is having to climb this metaphorical mountain every day and they struggle with it, what do you say to them? Do you complain to them about it? Tell them it's a chore to motivate them? Tell them that they're weak or stupid? Of course you wouldn't. That would be cruel and untrue. So why would you do it to yourself? 
We cannot see the mountains other people climb, but people cannot see yours either. Just because we cannot understand or see these struggles does not mean they are not there. Some people have to climb these mountains to even function. Doing that every day is an example of what real strength looks like. Comparisonitis. Comparisonitis is a colloquial term used to describe the psychological pattern where individuals constantly compare themselves to others. People that suffer from this often do it because they don't feel adequate. This often leads to people being dissatisfied with their own life. They often get caught up with thoughts that if they have more and more, they will be happier. More skills, more money, being more physically attractive, etc, etc. All feel like the cure, but what they do not realise is that external factors are not the fix for this. The cure, if you would even call it that, is to appreciate what you already have, but that can be really difficult when you're stuck in this mindset. You often do not feel like you have anything to offer. If we are to continue this analogy of pedestals and how you view yourself, I think it's very common that we do not see how others can admire us whilst we simultaneously admire them for what they offer. How you view yourself is not necessarily how others view you, nor will it always be true. It's very common to feel useless when everyone else around you is seemingly successful in some way. We put our peers on pedestals for their good qualities and only compare specific traits against them. Those traits being those particular facets that we desire. We can still be good at something, but we often don't think about that. Some people can create amazing art, especially in this fandom. Some people will amaze you with what they can do with a computer. Others might have incredible self-discipline and you might lament on how you don't have that. And there's nothing wrong with looking up to others. There's usually a good reason for it, but the issue starts when you start to view them as better than ourselves on the whole. I used to work at a college as a field support engineer. After two years into this career, I was asked to go work at another site because the only OSX guy had suddenly resigned. That's Mac OS for those that uh, don't remember. There was only one other person in my department who was there. Uh, his name was Kev. Um, Kev was much more senior than me at the time. He was a systems administrator. However, when it came to field work, he was disabled. He couldn't walk very far, and he struggled with stairs, so when it came to any hands-on work in any classroom, I would always be the one to go, even if I had to do something which I knew nothing about. I didn't mind, of course, you know, it, it was my job. Kev would instruct me patiently over the phone. Um, he was intelligent and a great conversationalist, and acting in his stead taught me plenty, and I owe him a lot. I stayed there on site for months, and whilst there, I became familiar with all the staff and some of the students. I've never been trained on Mac support, but with Kev's help and constant exposure, I was able to become more confident and diagnose issues, you know, more quickly. However, since I started working on this site, I felt quite alone. All I had was Kev and he was part-time. When I struggled, I had no one to turn to. I had to keep working on issues until they were fixed. My colleagues didn't like working on Macs, so they were not much help most of the time. One day, while struggling on a particularly difficult problem, I asked Kev as to why I'm doing this and that he should just take over because he's better than me. These issues which had been going on for a long time seemed impossible for me to overcome and it made me feel useless because I reckoned that anyone else in my department could just fix this. I voiced this to him and this is what he answered with. All those teachers here, professors and those who have PhDs who are paid way more than me and you, always call you. I asked what he meant, and he said, They're not stupid. They're making the right decision to call you in their head. Don't look down on yourself because you haven't worked it out yet. When they have IT issues, who do they go to? Well, me, I suppose. That's right. All those smart asses who are well-educated come to you, an apprentice IT engineer for help, not me. They could call the main campus or me, but they don't. They call you. We just know different things, and based on that, you are the best person to work out what the problem is in their eyes. I argued, that doesn't fix the issue though, so why call me? 
They're not after some stranger who can fix something. They're after a person who they think can fix it, and they like them. It's all your other qualities that cause that. It's not just your IT skills. His sentiment was kind. We have different traits, skills, strengths, and weaknesses. He made me understand. A friend of mine put it very eloquently. Nobody is a better version of someone else. Body image. I've included this section because body image is the most obvious and biggest reason as to why some people compare themselves to others. Desiring external validation is normal, and this relates to the whole topic of strengths too, because I think a good quality a person can have is how attractive they are as a person. I've been told time and time again that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I always thought that that was just a kind way for a person to say that I'm ugly without actually saying it, but a year ago that changed. Beauty and what people find attractive is an entirely personal and subjective experience. I went on a trip to Barcelona last year. Me and seven other furry friends stayed at a villa and it was an amazing experience. I generally do not like taking my shirt off because I'm self-conscious, but I made an effort to not let these thoughts hold me back, but I still felt awkward when I was at the beach or at the pool. Most of my friends who were with me were younger than me, and all of them were in better shape than I was. One person who was with me was a literal bodybuilder. He's very buff, takes amazing care of himself, and it shows. I felt like a sack of potatoes stood next to a Greek god when I was shirtless around him. Everyone there was beautiful in my eyes, bar me. Pretty much every night, we went into the city or nearby town and crawled through each club. Now, as I mentioned, this was a furry vacation, so every bar we went to was either a gay or lesbian bar, and that's fine. I wasn't expecting any attention anyway, and I just wanted to hang with my friends. My friends got attention from other people in a lot of these bars, but I resisted being envious until, well, I'll just tell the story. I was in a bar with my friends, and I was feeling a bit self-conscious at the time. I was feeling a bit overwhelmed as well, but I didn't show it. Suddenly, these two random men pushed their way past my friends, including my bodybuilder friend, and came over to me. They started asking how I was, complimented my shirt, and then started running their fingers through my hair. I froze. I was like a deer in headlights. My friends intervened and pulled them off me and politely explained that I'm straight. These two men were disappointed, but we talked a little and they bought me a drink before they headed on their way. They clearly had other things on their mind. They pushed past the people I thought were beautiful to try and flirt with the ugly one. But that's the thing. I'm not going to tell these people that their opinion is wrong. That would be rude. In their eyes, I wasn't ugly, otherwise they wouldn't have done that. In their eyes, I was what they were interested in at that moment. After I gathered my thoughts, I realized that beauty really is in the eye of the beholder. In their eyes, I was who they wanted. I'm not conventionally attractive, but I'm still attractive to some people. In this moment, I realized that I was a hypocrite because what I'm generally attracted to isn't conventional either. For example, I'm not particularly attracted to lean women. I know it's more the norm these days, but when I was growing up, I only really felt any physical attraction to bigger women, and I've been that way since I was a teenager. What you think is attractive is not necessarily what others are going to be attracted to. Physical attraction is subjective. But this cycles right back round to what I said earlier. What you think of yourself is not going to be how others think of you. I bet a number of people who are watching this who think this resonates with them are bad at taking compliments and just brush them off. They are just being nice. They want something from me. If I accept a compliment, I'm being boastful or vain. Do those sound familiar? The thing is, if a person is complimenting you, it's actually a form of assertiveness. It's easier than being assertive to set a boundary, for example, 
but it's still a form of assertiveness. Someone who points out what you are good at or a positive quality you have is asserting their opinion of you on you. It takes effort to do that. People don't do it for no reason. I'm awful at taking compliments, but I've learned that if I accept what I'm being told, I actually start to believe it. Over time, I've learned to embrace feedback and that opens up the door for more positive thoughts. I don't know if this video will help anyone, but I want to at least try. These examples that I gave, you know, gave me perspective, and I hope it can do the same for others. Yeah, I was originally going to make this video about masculinity, of all things, because I think the term has been warped and twisted a lot in the last decade, but it made me think about personal strengths and how being strong also means not using strengths vainly. But then my ADHD adult brain went on a tangent about how people who use their strengths vainly, you know, might do that because they're ultimately insecure, the fear of looking weak, and that made me think about what real strength is in a person and how one person who might not be good at X, Y, or Z, you know, started their journey at the base of a metaphorical mountain where others may have started near the peak. And that led me here to personal strengths. You know, the personal strengths people might not think that they have and why the best of us often put themselves down. And, you know, comparisonitis, it, it's not a new thing, but there seems to be a lot of it in the furry fandom. And I do think that there are people here in the fandom who put too much emphasis on being a furry when it comes to being successful. You know? And they completely forget everything outside of that. You don't, you don't need to be an amazing artist. You don't need to be able to make fursuits. You know, animations or whatever. Things that are, you know, heavily tied to the furry fandom. All these things are great, don't get me wrong, but they are ultimately external factors. And I think people look at these things and think, that's success. Well, you can be successful in different ways. You know, and you can be a positive force in the world just by being kind. And if that means being kind and compassionate to yourself to bring out a person who can really shine, then I think that you should get started on doing that. But anyway, thank you for listening. I hope this helps someone out there.